A uh, few months ago, uh, Clint and Elizabeth Miller called me uh, with a hard job. They asked me to come speak here. And then a, a couple of weeks ago, they called me with an even harder job, uh, and that was they asked me to introduce Otto Scott. Um, <coughs> the facts about Otto uh, really are inadequate to give you an idea of uh, his importance and uniqueness. He's the author of seven books. He's an ex-journalist. Uh, past editor, past executive assistant to the chairman of Ashland Oil. He is a president, counsel and associate, and a communications consultant. Uh, but that's not enough. He is also a revisionist historian. Uh, he's a stimulating essayist and stylist, uh, as you know, if you read uh, what comes out monthly in the Councilman Report. Uh, he is a thinker who is insightful, uh, original, completely unintimidated and relentlessly truthful. Uh, he also is possessed of a unique and dry sense of humor as any of you may have experienced. But he's not only been, uh, a, he's not only all these things, he's also been for me a great personal encouragement and uh, an encouragement to professional excellence. So if you would join me now in welcoming Otto Scott. Thank you very much, and good morning. It may seem to some of you that we are faced with so many different troubling challenges to Christianity from so many sources that we are up against Goliath. But in reality, we are confronted with only one great challenge, and that challenge can be identified and overcome. Not easily, not immediately, and not without risk. Before we discuss these dangers, however, we must first admit that the American Christian community has not faced up to its obligations has not properly defended its fellow Christians throughout the world and has failed in its intellectual obligation to properly describe the challenge to Christianity in terms that all Christians can understand. In order to do that, we we'll have to understand the overall pattern of events. We have to be able to analyze trends that include Christians in other lands as well as ourselves. For we are not confronted simply with a challenge to American Christianity, but by a worldwide Christian challenge, by forces who have studied history and learned its lessons, and who are moving with sinister intelligence to overcome and to destroy the faith. First, let's look abroad. In Poland a few years ago, the commissars confronted food shortages and other consequences of a planned economy. And to take people's minds off these troubles, they decided to relax their controls over leisure activities, the theater, literature, and the movies. And taking advantage of that particular thaw, some Polish movie makers produced a film titled Dan Tom. As some of you probably know, Dan Tom was a leading figure in the French Revolution during the early stages of that event. When the event started, Dan Tom was only 30 years old, and he was living in a bohemian section of Paris. He was well married, and he had a good practice. But the young intellectuals with whom he associated kept criticizing the system and the culture of the country, and he joined them in this particular movement and became a member of the Jacobin Society, together with Robespierre and others. When the Jacobins became powerful in the revolution, Danton rose to very high levels. 
He was a very popular speaker, and he was a favorite of the crowd. And he became rich, and he traded his wife in for a younger version. And he compromised in other directions as well. He went along with a series of grisly revolutionary murders. But when the tribunals began to gather in his friends, he protested. And that got him into trouble with Robespierre. Because Robespierre did not believe you could put your personal feelings ahead of the revolution. Revolutions, however, Danton didn't understand. Revolutions don't stop. They keep rolling. They begin with throwing men out of office, and they continue to the point of massacre. Danton drew back for reasons of friendship, and Robespierre hated him for having that much scruple. In due course, Danton was arrested and tried on a series of vague charges and found guilty and carried off in the trumples to the guillotine. He said to the executioner, show my head to the crowd. It's worth it. The Poles made a movie about Danton in defiance of the commissars, for they know the history of the French Revolution, where every man contradicted which is the same as the history of the Russian Revolution. Every man who ever contradicted Stalin at any time, for any reason, was later killed at his direction. And it's clear that the Polish movie makers so hoped that the same fate would overcome all their rulers. And they made the movie as a sort of a warning to the West about the nature of revolution, and I admire their courage in having done so. Unfortunately, most Americans have never heard of Danton. The French Revolution is not taught in our schools, I understand, and this is a great educational crime because the French debacle was the first secular revolution in all history. One would expect it to be taught in every school and in every church as an example of what can happen when men declare war against God. For the leaders of the French Revolution not only launched a war against God, they declared war against anyone who believed in God, or who prayed to God, or who honored God. They outlawed Christianity. And for Christians to allow so great a crime to be covered over by socialist propaganda about social progress has amounted to intellectual surrender by Christians to their sworn enemies. Of course, the French Revolution didn't last. It was eventually halted and in part reversed by Napoleon who re restored the Christian church and recreated the aristocracy and placed the family back as a basic unit of society, elevated the concept of honor, patriotism, and traditional values in general. But his effort was flawed by military speculations and adventures, and French society was too deeply injured by the revolution to ever fully recover. The descendants of the revolution and the descendants of those whom the revolution dispossessed and the descendants of those whom, the, whom Napoleon elevated continued to quarrel about the French Revolution for generations. Nothing, it seemed, could erase the memory of that event from the mind of the French people until the socialists took control of education. And you can imagine my surprise when I learned that when the Polish film of Danton was shown in Paris, the French students had to be told who he was because they had never heard of him. History is not taught in France today. It's not taught in the United States. Most Americans consider history unimportant. 
They're ignorant of the history of their own civilization and even their own nation. Of course, there's very little excuse for this. People who know how to read and write should educate themselves. But it's significant that in general people today are more ignorant than their grandfathers or their great-grandfathers. And to consider this decline a mere matter of incompetence in the part of the educational establishment is a sort of naivete. Our civilization has undergone many vicissitudes, and I speak not simply of the United States, but of the European civilization of which we are the intellectual and cultural heirs. I speak of Christianity, born nearly 2,000 years ago, which struggles with the pagan philosophers and pagan savages alike, and struggles successfully. This civilization was once spread across every land on earth to every people. And for such a civilization to abandon its memory and to forget its past is to pursue intellectual death. Solzhenitsyn said to destroy a people you must first sever their roots. Now that observation can be differently expressed. When the roots are severed, someone is out to destroy a people. It's significant that ignorance in the West about Danton and the French revolutionaries is not true in the communist countries. The Poles thought they were touching a common theme, a common chord of recollection, <coughs> because in Warsaw, in Moscow, in Budapest, in Leningrad, everyone has taught about the French Revolution because it was the precursor and the model for the Russian Revolution and for all secular revolutions to this day. The Soviets reincarnated the French Revolution and carried it further. Lenin said that Robespierre and his Committee of Public Safety, which had directed the terror, was not sufficiently vigorous, and he said, we will not make that mistake. Nor did he. The terror unleashed in Moscow in 1917 has not yet come to an end. And the Soviets intend to carry that revolution to every end of the earth. And as in France so very long ago, the Russian Revolution is a war against God and all who believe in God. It is a felony in the USSR to give a Bible to anyone who is under the age of 18. It is a felony to hold an unlicensed church service and will result in exile to the gulag and to slavery. The anti-Christianism has spread through nation after nation to every area where the Marxists have governed. It now encompasses half the world Half the world lives under pagan in paganism in power. That's the great international challenge that confronts us. And it does not confront us only outside our borders, but confronts us here at home as well. In order to confront this challenge intelligently, we must educate ourselves and our children on how revolutions grow and how revolutionaries can be disarmed and defeated. And this education must be spread as quickly and as far as possible for indifference to history and ignorance about the nature of secular revolutions has placed Christianity and our nation and ourselves into very great danger. And this kind of challenge cannot be overcome by intellectual indolence. Before we can educate our children about the revolution, we must first educate ourselves. We must understand the stages and the arguments of secular revolution. They're not too difficult to grasp. They have been repeated so often in this century that if they were not so dangerous, they would bore. 
They involve, however, recognition of the reality of time, the passage of time, which makes danger seem ever distant until the final stage. Administrations come and go, and the nation seems the same. King Louis XIV of France ruled absolutely for 53 years and towered over all Western Europe all that time. And France became in that period the richest and most populous nation in the West. It led all others in art, literature, wealth, and manners. It had 25 million people when England had five and we had three. French architecture was the grandest, its furniture the most elegant, its buildings the most magnificent, its cities the largest, its commerce the greatest in all the world. But the society that enjoyed all that splendor was sick. The Sun King outlived the patience of his people, his wars and his taxes, his palaces and his extravagance drained the treasury. When he died, leaving an infant grandson on the throne, French intellectuals had caught revolutionary fire from London. And the danger of these ideas was not at first recognizable, for England had achieved a sort of precarious stability. And they didn't reach that plateau easily. They had had two revolutions in the preceding century. The first under Cromwell was religious and established liberties of which England is still proud. Then they underwent a reaction when Charles II resumed the Stuart dynasty. And with Charles came a wave of anti-Christian sarcasm, ridicule, and persecution that sent tens of thousands of Presbyterians and Puritans to our shores. Then the English rebelled a second time against Charles's brother James in what they call today their great and glorious revolution, which was actually a fairly routine shift in administration, ostensibly in the name of religion, but actually part of power politics. And throughout, the English continued to hold Christianity and especially Calvinism in deep contempt. Little or none of that is taught here. Most Americans are hazy about this nation prior to 1776, but what is more to the present point is that Voltaire visited London while ridicule against religion was still in high fashion. And he was there spending his lottery winnings. He caught the anti-Christian infection. When he returned to Paris, he spread the disease throughout France and throughout intellectual and artistic circles at a time when the French government had revealed itself to be incompetent. Time passed. In modern terms, a great deal of time, approximately 60 years. Louis XV reigned and died. Louis XVI appeared. Voltaire spent at least 50 of these years satirizing Christianity, patriotism, and all traditional values. And he succeeded in launching a fashion that was so successful it astonished him. And toward the end, even he began to have doubts as increasingly radical writers and playwrights began to outstrip his outrageousness. But by then it was too late. Virtually every French intellectual was convinced that all French history was, as Voltaire said, a history of criminality. Meanwhile, France had lost North America. It depleted its treasury to help our war of independence. Its aristocracy had become parasitic. Its church was corrupt. Its king was stupid. Its middle class was prosperous but unhappy. Its commerce increased but crime proliferated. Pornography became fashionable. Homosexuals held fancy dress balls. Traditional values were mocked. Christianity was held in intellectual contempt. Rousseau argued that man is good and only society is criminal. And he wasn't alone in announcing new theories. Diderot undertook to categorize all human knowledge in the intellectuals 
got together to put together the world's first encyclopedia in which Christianity was put down as superstition and science. You can imagine how much science they had in the 1780s was held at all. What they wanted was to erase history and to start all over again. Man, by reason alone, would create a perfect world, which meant to them a world without God. That was how it started, by men who thought they would enlighten all mankind. And to this day, that almost childlike assumption has been called the Enlightenment. History is filled with such jokes at which God laughs. But the intellectuals didn't actually launch the revolution, they only prepared the way. They couldn't have done this if the faith of France had been strong, if the church had not been corrupt, if the government had not been incompetent, and spiritual weakness, confusion, and corruption was not prevalent. This weakness created opportunities for unscrupulous men who were willing to pay any price, commit any act, for the sake of supreme power. Many such men at that time were middle-class lawyers and journalists anxious to attain positions of influence. They used arguments invented by the intellectuals, arguments that floated in the air, against the king and the queen, the clergy, the military, the aristocracy, all the institutions that held France together. And these criticisms appeared in vulgar and even pornographic terms in new publications by new writers and orators who suddenly appeared all over the country. The source of the money for these publications and individuals remains a mystery. What is not mysterious is that France then had many international enemies. Frederick the Great of Prussia sent agents into Paris. William Pitt sent agents into Paris from London. The Spaniards had reason to resent French prominence and had agents active. Austria, Hungary, not absent, and so forth. The largest and richest nation of Europe at that period was like a sick lion trailed by foreign jackals and vultures. But the greatest enemies of Christianity and the French monarchy and French society were inside France and were French. These revolutionaries set up a bewildering number of social clubs. They published all sorts of journals ranging from cartoon books to scholarly efforts they hired halls and they paid lecturers. They swayed school teachers and they seduced priests and nuns and they worked day and night to change the government in the name of progress. For revolutions are not born in a vacuum. They do not arise by spontaneous combustion, no matter what you may have heard. The people do never rise. There is no such thing. They are organized from the top. <coughs> they do not spring from injustice, but from ambition. Revolutions are launched always by men anxious for power, funded by others who want to see them succeed. They can move forward only against a confused people and a weak government. In France in the late 1780s, the government opened the gate for the final stage because it needed money. Its credit had dried up. The interest on the national debt had reached such a high level that they could no longer afford to pay for the operations of daily government. The advisors told the king he would have to raise taxes, but of course he wasn't going to say that out loud. What they said is, that, let's reform the tax situation. <laughs> so therefore they called the National Assembly, they called the National Assembly together, the three estates, the Estates General, they called it, in May 1789 to examine the system and to reform it. The three estates, the aristocracy, the clergy, and the commons, and Macaulay later wrote, a fourth estate also appeared, the press. 
Once they got together, the commons insisted that there should be more reforms than simply the taxes. They demanded all sorts of rights, and the king agreed. So national elections were held, and a new legislation called, legislature called the National Assembly came together, dominated by liberals. And they, they demanded a new constitution. And the king went along with this. So a constitution was drafted, reducing the king's power to a constitutional level. New elections and a new National Assembly appeared, this time dominated by radicals. And the radicals pushed the liberals who pushed the monarchists out altogether. And the clergy was swept aside as unimportant. And then the aristocrats were stripped of their tax exemptions, and so were the churches. And a series of investigations began inside the National Assembly, many trials by committees of people who had committed crimes against the people, against the aristocrats, against the clergy. And by that time, of course, the courts no longer counted, because not only did they find these people guilty, but the guillotine began to function, and they sent them to their death. Now, this sounds very complicated, and it sounds as though it took a long time. I'll tell you, from the time the estate general met in Versailles in May 1789 until the time the guillotine began to cut heads off was three years. That was when men had to use horses to send letters. That was awfully quick. By then, the French people knew that they were involved in something irrevocable, and there was no way to stop it. And throughout the whole process, the newspapers kept saying, everybody is on the march. When, as a matter of fact, only a small percentage of people were on the march. Most people got up, got dressed, had breakfast, and went to work. Because very few people can afford to go on marches. They can't spend the time demonstrating and rioting. Money was involved. Because those who spent the time were not rich, they were hired. But the newspapers made it seem as though this was a national phenomenon. And in the course of this, the church was stripped of all its land and buildings, which were declared national property. The clergy lost everything. Its tax exemptions, its pensions, its clothing, its status. And of course, the nobility was stripped of its land, its mansions, its titles. An entire class of people began to be murdered for belonging to that class. And this was not a question of guilt or innocence. This was a question of who you were, who your parents had been. The courts were swept aside, and the committees of the National Assembly ran the country. The Committee of Public Safety was headed by Ropierre, and that was the one who signed the death certificates and so forth and so on. Now, the next great revolution, which we will not go into in such detail, obviously, because we're running out of time, was a repeat, and it was in Russia. The monarchy, as in France, clung to absolute power for a while, and there was a long build-up by the intellectuals against the system, which began, say, in 1860 or so, and continued until the turn of the century, at which time the Russians lost the war with Japan. And that so uh, weakened the status and the image of the government that the Tsar and his men agreed to a constitution, they agreed to a limitation of the Tsar's powers, they agreed to a new election, elected legislature called the Duma. And they limped along with this new modern, very uh, liberal government until 19... 16, when the government was in real trouble again because of defeats in World War I. In 1917, in March, they persuaded the Tsar to abdicate, and he did, very peacefully. And not only did he abdicate, but the man he nominated to succeed him, the Grand Duke, refused the honor. So that left him without a king.
about a czar. And they set up a provisional government consisting of committees from the Duma. And the monarchists, being liberals, invited the men of the left into the committees, the Social Democrats. And the Social Democrats, being men of the left, threw the liberals out, first thing they did. And invited all the men of the left to come and join them and help create a new government in Russia. And this message reached Trotsky in New York, and it reached Lenin in Zurich, and it reached Stalin in internal exile, and the Bolsheviks came together with the rest of the men of the left. So in October, October, there was another great change, because in the meantime, we were talking now about the middle of World War I, the German government had devised a way of winning the war. One of the many ways was to see if they could stir up a revolution behind the lines in France, in Britain, and in Russia. <coughs> they financed the Easter uprising in Dublin to distract the British. They financed subversion in France, which was so successful that it succeeded in corrupting various members of the French Chamber of Deputies and launching a mutiny inside the French army in 1917. And they gave 50 million gold marks to Lenin to start up a revolution in Russia. And with the 50 million gold marks, it was very interesting. Lenin and Trotsky's first step with all that money, and that was like a billion dollars today or more in cash. The first step they took was to buy 47 newspapers. The ideas come first. The propaganda comes first. Then they bought guns, and then they hired people to use the guns. Because at a time of shortages, money was really important. That's how the revolution was launched. And in October, they took over by force the Duma. And they put the Social Democrats in prison and shot them and started the, the uh, system that we know today. Now, again, we get back to the question of time. The preparation was from 1860 to 1914. That's a long time, almost 50 years, about the equivalent time that it took in France. The final stage, however, was very quick. From the time the Tsar abdicated till the time the Bolsheviks took power by force was only nine months. Nine months! That's when they had telegraph, telephone, automobiles, and railroads. They just got past the horse stage. Now, the third revolution that I want to touch very briefly was in Germany. Big, long build-up again. The left came into power in the 1880s and 1890s to such an extent that Bismarck put social programs into effect in order to take away the weapons of the, we of the left. By, by World War I, of course, the government lost its credibility through deceit, and the Social Democrats took over the whole government, and they set up a sort of a left-wing government. Great rhetoric, wonderful constitution, never applied. They ruled mostly by decree. And having no particular love for traditional German culture or the traditional German people, they allowed all sorts of left-wing excesses to exist. Plus, of course, there was activities of the Marxists in post-World War I Germany and a race between the Nazis and the Communists to take the power of government away from the Social Democrats. And we're talking now about all left groups. Because even the Nazis call themselves National Socialists. They won the race in a way, a peculiar way, a legal way, because von Hindenburg, who was a figurehead, was senile and was persuaded to appoint Hitler Chancellor. He was appointed Chancellor in January, January 31st, I believe, 1933. By the end of February, 30, 30 days later, more or less, he had life and death power given to him by the Reichstag over every person in Germany. 30 days. It was so fast that even the Marxists were caught off guard. Now you will notice in all three of the revolutions that I've discussed, 
that they all have a similar pattern. In each case, supreme power was taken away from the executive. In each case, the executive was either eliminated or reduced to impotence. And in each case, the new power arose within the legislature. Now, this is very natural because you cannot win a revolution from the street. You can only accomplish a revolution from the offices of government. And the people were used to obeying office, the offices of government, not voices from the street. So therefore, the parliament, or the Duma, or the National Assembly, or the United States Congress, has the authority to call men in and examine their beliefs and to reduce the president to the status of a high civil servant, answerable. When did you know? What did you know? The excuse can vary. The diamond necklace in the French Revolution, Rasputin in the Russian Revolution, disorder in the streets in the German Revolution, problem of foreign policy in the American Revolution. Because what I am describing to you is the background of revolution so that you will understand where we are. We are on the verge of the final stage of the Amer American Revolution. And we are the only organized Christian group in history who knows how to define that revolution and how to stop it. And this afternoon we'll talk about that. And in the meantime, I thank you very much for your courtesy.